I'm here with Javier Reyes of Locked On Padres. Say what's up, Javi. What's up, guys? Of course, we're going to be talking about the breakout of the teenage prospect that we all have been excited about this year. And that's right. It's 30-something-year-old Jerks and Profar. You are Locked On Padres, your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on to the World Series champion Texas Rangers and also locked on to the San Diego Padres. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six of the founder and host of this podcast. Joining me today is Javier Reyes, host of Locked On Padres. Say what's up, Javi. What is going on, everybody? What's going on? I hope everybody is thriving and vibing on this lovely Tuesday morning um, because we got ourselves a series, man. We're back at it. Very weird and dare I say criminal that we did not have Padres and Rangers games on a Monday night. I, I-, I will say really let us drop the ball there, universe, but we're still back, man, and I'm happy to be with you as always. Happy to have you here as my NL team, my NL um, association vibes always go out to the pod. And before we get into today's show, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up customers, all customers, with a bo- boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now, here we are with two teams that are both, uh, well, eight or more games back in the division. Actually, I think both exactly eight games back. Nope, seven and a half games back for the Padres and eight games back for the Rangers. Both teams that are trying to make this playoff push, both teams that are very much in their window of contention. And, and Javi, I'm here to ask you, who needs to win this series more? Is it the Padres or is it the Rangers? This is a good question because I feel like the one thing that you can say is, well, yes, the Padres don't have a recent World Series victory that they can hark back on if people try to slander them or if things are brought up in question and whatnot. And you can also bring up the fact that AJ Preller, manager of the Padres, is is probably on the hot seat. So, or GM of the Padres, I think, is probably on the hot seat. This is a team that has been wildly disappointing uh, for a while now. Um, but they are still 46 and 42. While the Texas Rangers are in a little bit tighter of an American League, Uh, Although I do think the National League has gotten slightly better lately, but the American League is a lot tighter. And the Padres for so long this year have been like at times a game under 500 and still having a wild card spot. And I think that there are teams in the National League more than the American League that might be sellers, i.e. they might get worse as time goes on. We'll see what happens with the D-backs. We'll see what happens with the Cubs. Cubs, there was reports coming out that actually said they might be a team that's selling at the deadline. So I think for that reason, I actually think and. The Padres fans are going to be mad. I think it's probably a bigger series for the Rangers right now in terms of this season. In terms of like fan-based mindset, obviously it's bigger for the Padres because the Rangers just won a World Series. But you said it in your own intro. You know what I mean? But I think all in all, tougher American League with a lot more teams in play while you have the Astros and Mariners that are both ahead of the Rangers right now on top of the other teams vying for the wild card. So for me right now, I think it's I think it's bigger for the Rangers. Yeah, and the Rangers had just come off of uh, what was honestly a horrifying month of June. I mean, just truly (laughs) terrible. I mean, they look like they were finally starting to turn a corner. They won two out of three games in L.A. against the Dodgers in a series where they had a negative eight run differential for the series. (laughs) But they won two close games at the end, pulled out a series win, say, okay, things are looking better. Then they get swept by the Mariners in Seattle. Then they lose two out of three to the Grimace Pride Mets, um, of course, (laughs) because the Mets suddenly became unstoppable in the month of June. Then they win the final game of that series, win three straight against the Royals, because for some reason the Rangers just always beat the Royals, riding a four-game winning streak, then turn that around into a six-game losing streak and just snapped that on Sunday night baseball with a Wyatt Langford cycle and a very much needed um, breakout win. But this is, this has been a couple of teams that have been, you know, big spenders, big triers, big doers of things, which, you know, we have talked about many times about Mm -hmm. the importance of doing things and trying and actually, you know, spending money on good baseball players, how that's, you know, genuinely beneficial for your team. And, you know, the fact that both these teams have not been doing as well as they expected, it feels like 
I mean, it's too dramatic to say, but I'm a dramatic person. So I'm going to say it anyway, it feels like a, a war for baseball soul. You know, these teams that, you know, haven't tried as hard that haven't, you know, gone out and spent this money that haven't, you know, gone out and, you know, just made these aggressive swings to, mm -hmm. you know, acquire talent and things like that, seeing them succeed while the Rangers and Padres don't. And while the Rangers and Padres get clowned for, you know, trying things, it just really pisses me off and it's mm -hmm. going to be a thing that continues. And, I think that the Rangers winning the World Series the way that they did with that you know, quick turnaround, I think it has a positive impact on the view of these teams, you know, making these wild swings, being aggressive, trying to do these fast turnarounds, even though things might not be, you know, you don't have to lose for six, seven, eight straight years to turn things around. Is that kind of your opinion on how, you know, the league has changed a little bit of their view? Um, you know, the or the the Padres possibly benefiting from the Rangers winning that World Series? Yeah, I think it was actually good overall for baseball. I think it was really bad, and obviously I have a bias, but I think it was really disastrously bad. And not just the Padres, in fairness, but also the Mets, that they were both just disastrous last year. I think that's bad for the sport. I think that there's plenty of uh, people who have been gaslit by Moneyball type of thinking to think that spending is actually bad. I think that there are plenty of media people who love to harp on teams like the Guardians, Rays, and Brewers who never win anything. The Brewers, in fact, last time they were in the World Series was when they were in the American League, and yet they get a lot of praise even though they have a free ticket to the playoffs every year and do nothing in terms of spending. I do think that that is bad for the sport that sometimes that's not brought up more. Um, and I think that, yeah, it at least is like, hey, guys, good. Like, look, the Rangers, not only did they win the World Series, not only were they a really fun team to watch, but they were also one of the five worst teams in baseball the year before that, right? So it showed you, yes, there is the downside. But one thing you're probably dealing with as a Texas fan is a lot of people say, hey, is Dak Prescott the guy? Is he the guy? Is this and that? And it's like, maybe he isn't. That's true. It's really hard to win sometimes if you don't know how good your quarterback is. You know what's even harder, though? Not having a quarterback. So while, yes, it is hard and it is frustrating if you are a Padres fan, you say, man, this Xander Bogart's contract is killing us. The Hosmer contract is killing us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the teams that don't even try that never win the World Series with the exception of the albatross anomalous uh, Kansas City Royals team uh, that even Royals fans will tell you, yeah, we uh, <laughs> got a little lucky. <laughs> you know, we, we, we got a little lucky that postseason. And all credit to them. They built a really great team. That's not taking away from them, but it's just not consistent with it overall. It also does not mean that you have to spend $300 million on a team, but there's just fundamentally you see from the Astros to the Yankees to the Padres to even occasionally teams like the Nationals and the Braves that you do have to spend a certain amount because it affects how you enter trade talks, right? People don't think about that part. It's not just bringing in superstars. It's the fact that you have leverage. So you know why the Oakland A's keep getting shafted in trades? Because every team can walk in there and be like, we know you're trading him. You know what I mean? Like you have to. So here's what we're giving you for him. They have no leverage in any of these trades. So that affects things. It affects things that if you have a guy who's a free agent next year, you don't have to trade them because theoretically you could keep them. It just impacts so many aspects and layers. Um, on the game on a multitude of levels. So I'm still proud of the Padres for spending as much as they have, especially for a team that never has spent money, right? This is not a big market team, but uh, so far, while yes, they've been frustrating. They have been really turning it around lately and they look like a team that's legitimate. They look like a team that is going to be as what happens every season. There's always a second half ish breakout team. And the Padres are one of the, the nominees for that. And so far, they are becoming one of those teams. And I am amped to whoop on the little old Rangers and show them who's the real top dog around here. Because for some reason, by the way, Padres might be the Rangers kryptonite. I don't believe they've won a series against them since as long as we've been uh, doing this podcast, at least. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, since the Slam Diego gate. I think yeah. I think that, <laughs> that was a real turning point for this Rangers franchise. But no, the uh, it's good seeing these teams be aggressive. And even when the Padres, mm -hmm. you know, when they when C Peter Seidler did pass away and, you know, there were some questions about the finances and, you know, they, they did have to end up, you know, trading off Juan Soto. They didn't do it in a way where it's like, Oh, okay. That window's done. Now we're, mm -hmm. we're done contending. It's no, we're going to trade for assets that can help us win now. And maybe a little bit more in the future, you know, but guys who are, are helping now, like Michael King, I mean, a, a huge help right now. And mm -hmm. one of the prospects they got in that deal, they turned around and turned into Dylan mm -hmm. cease, like seeing them still try and keep that window open which is a very very difficult thing to do it looked like the rangers were going to do that in spades and that this offense was just going to be amazing for years and years to come hasn't quite been that but um you know keeping that window of sustainability open occasionally requires guys 
to come out and have breakout years that you didn't expect. We're we'll talking about one for the Padres right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You know, I love sports, and I went so much that I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games, and the sports aren't sporting as much as I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up all kinds of bets whenever I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right, so there's something for everybody, every day, all summer long. If you want to bet on some World Series odds for the Padres to get their first ever World Series, where are they on this FanDuel odd sheet? Why are they not showing up here as one of the top teams? I know the Rangers right now are at plus 5,500. 5, 5, uh, there you go. Padres do have better odds than the Rangers right now at plus 3,600. So if you're thinking this is the year we're going to go back to back with new champions, franchises who had never won World Series or any kind of other bets you want to go, head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Now, I am a big prospect head, and the first prospect that really got me into prospects in general was a young Curacao shortstop, a young man by the name of Jerickson Profar, who came up all the way back in 2012 as a 19-year-old, a guy who was a switch-hitting top prospect in baseball, pretty, pretty uniformly, the number one mm -hmm. overall prospect oh, yeah. in baseball, a guy with so much expectations, a 19-year-old. Played in 19 games, nine games that year, 17 plate appearances. But most electric was his first major league plate appearance, a home run, and a joyous, joyous moment. Uh, we thought we'd have so many more moments to come for Jerickson Profar. But alas, things did not quite work out that way. It was hard for Jerickson Profar to break into the big leagues, become an everyday player. Then the Rangers cleared up a spot for him. They had the middle infield was pretty well locked up with Ian Kinsler, multi-time all-star, super underrated player at second base. Then Elvis Andrews, young shortstop, thriving at shortstop for years and years to come. And, oh, you're going to put him at third base? No, sorry. That's Adrian Beltre. So the Rangers made a big trade. They traded off Ian Kinsler for Prince Fielder. Obviously, that deal didn't quite work out the way the Rangers intended it to. Opening a spot at second base for Jerks and Profar, but shoulder injuries and other injuries and just... Non-production ended up him with him leaving the Rangers on a trade to Oakland in 2019. Never really put it all together for a year. The closest that it came was that final year in Texas, his age 25 season, 146 mm -hmm. games, 20 home runs that year, uh, nearly 800 OPS. Solid, but not great. And then he stopped being able to throw, which was a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. And he moved from second base to left field and bounced around a little with Oakland, then with the Padres for a few years, then one year in Colorado. And now back with the Padres, having the year of his life. He is smiling brighter than ever. Best smile on Major League Baseball, hitting the crap out of the baseball and doing things that I have long imagined Jerickson Profar to do. What is going on with my large adult Kurosawian son? He is, even when the Padres have been bad and there have been times this year, you see my tweets where like they just go up and down below 500 and above 500, all that stuff. He's always been a constant. Um, he is one of the reasons like I like sports. Um, I've been dramatic about this on the podcast before. I talked about this show called Sports Night, where the first episode is about these two guys. They're sports anchors, and one of them like wants to quit because he doesn't like sports anymore. He doesn't like the system. He doesn't like how many things get impacted. He doesn't like that we have to ignore when athletes or people involved in this sport are awful people just because they throw a ball far or they manage good, right? Like He becomes disgruntled with it, and then he has this moment where he's watching a sporting event where this guy, uh, who it's a fictional, uh, character who like you know came back to track and field for the first time in six years and he survived like having all these injuries and whatnot and what happens he breaks the world record and something and he tunes in he calls up his son and he's like reminded why he likes sports again that's what jerks and profar has been for me um this is a guy who's eighth in major league baseball and wrc plus uh while he's not necessarily up there and wins above replacement he's still 17th uh because he's not a very good defensive player but Everything about him, the on-base percentage, all the stuff with every time someone seems to mess with this guy, 
right? Celebrating whatever it is, throwing inside, hits the walk-off hit against the 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 chump uh Washington Nationals, as I like to call them, you know, and then the day after, you know, the team sticking up for him too. Manny Machado hits a home run, all that stuff. It's really, really great. And it's just so out of nowhere. He's already surpassed his career high in wins above replacement. He's at 2.8 right now. His previous career high was 2.5 with the Padres, by the way. For inexplicably, he's the only guy that just seems to get better with the Padres. It's, it's very, very odd, but it's been amazing to watch. And for a team that also, importantly, Fernando Tatis Jr. is hurt right now. And even before he wasn't hurt, he was a good Good player, uh, above average player um, offensively, but he didn't kick into gear until June. So then you had Jerickson Profar making up for it. Manny Machado only recently got a lot better. Jackson Merrill has been extremely blowing up. Uh, I love your intro, by the way, alluding to Wyatt Langford <laughs> and Jackson Merrill. That was really a genius by you. Um, <laughs> That was good stuff. Like Xander Bogart's not being good and being on the IL to have a guy like Profar, the worst qualified position player, according to Fangraphs wins above replacement last year, I believe it was negative 1.7. Let me check that real quick. Yes. Negative 1.7 for you to now be this good. It's just, it's amazing, (laughs) man. It's, it's just an unbelievable story. And he's been just paramount to the Padres success and I cannot talk enough about him genuinely has made me believe even if the Padres weren't good it reminds me of why I like sports because you just can't predict stuff like this one year one million I've asked people who are baseball freakazoids there's no comp for not as a player but as a story for what Jerickson and Profar is doing this late into a career never having anything prior being the worst player in baseball the year before and for a one year one million contract at age 30 and for him to be this good, the only comparison people have come up with is R.A. Dickey. So that's just, it's an incredible sign. And I love him. I love him so much, man. It's just so great. It's amazing. It makes me so happy. Like this, like everyone loves a comeback story. And I feel like a lot of times in sports, the comeback stories are like, oh, you know, some person, you know, inflicted some, you know, bad thing upon somebody and suffered consequences for it. And oh, this is them coming back from that. Or like, I don't know, like just, it's not as, uh, it, it it's like, oh, one injury happened and then they overcame that, which like not to diminish that by any means, like that's that's great coming back from injury or whatever. But like the top the, things like this don't happen of like guy who no. was top prospect, all the expectations in the world, like injuries just completely dera- derailed him, like and just completely, I'm sure, sapped the joy out of the sport for him. Like, like how could it not? Like, how could it not take all that joy? And he was, that was one of the things that I loved about Profar is like, he was always one of the most joyous. Like, like I said, like the best smile in Major Mm -hmm. League Baseball, like just absolutely contagious personality, just so happy, so beloved by all of his teammates, everyone around him, just such an awesome person. And for years and years and years and years, just does not quite live up to the expectations. Just doesn't do that. And he wasn't even like, you know, just fine everyday player. Like he's subpar. And it broke my heart watching him do that and defending this guy. And saying, no, be injury related. A lot of that, right? Like a bunch of shoulder stuff. Like that's part of why he derailed. It's not like he was just, I mean, don't get me wrong. He didn't pan out in certain ways. There were some skills issues for sure. But a big part of it was the guy like blew out his arm practically like twice. It felt like so Mm -hmm. that's part of the reason why he fell off. And I don't think that. You just don't have this happen. It is never, ever it happens. Was, it happens where someone's like, they have a cute little season. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like they have a cute little, like, you know, Derek Rose in the NBA. Like, oh, cool. Like you're still like positionally, like you can play in the NBA. Um, it's the first one that came to mind. My bad. Um, but like, <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like at least, but you don't have a season where you become one of the pound for pound best batters in baseball. That doesn't happen. That's crazy. Yeah, but and so the thing friend. the thing about him coming up is that like a lot of his value. So he was a shortstop coming up. Like he was think yeah. of what when Fr- Francisco Lindor is doing now. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what the projection, the mm-hmm. expectation was for Profar. Yeah. He was going to be an elite defensive shortstop. He had a fantastic arm. He's a switch hitter. Mm-hmm. Not a whole whole bunch of power, but decent and really really good. You know, plate discipline, like mm-hmm. good instincts, good pitch recognition, things like that. He was going to be mm-hmm. a guy who you know hit around 300, 15, 20 bombs, maybe 25 of things break really correctly. 
play gold glove defense. That's a multi-time all-star. That's why the ceiling was so high on him. Like mm-hmm. there wasn't some thought that, oh, he's going to hit like, you know, 30, 40 home runs and he's going to hit, you know, 350 and blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, he's going to be a pretty good player for a long time. And a lot of that value was in the defense. And when you completely blow out your shoulder, just completely blew it out, missed all the 2014 season. That was the one year that the Rangers missed the postseason from 2010 to 2016 because everybody and their mother got hurt. I mean, that was the year that, you know, Prince Fielder's Mr. Iron Man had a neck inch issue that would eventually end his career. And also the shoulder injury that would derail Jerks and Profar's career. And eventually you Darvish also would have to end up having Tommy John surgery a year later. He had to end the season early because he was having issues with the elbow. And then it turns out it was Tommy John and they didn't know until the next year. Um, But seeing that, seeing him battle through this, you know, make even like just last year when he was a free agent, I was like, the Rangers don't really have space for him, but I I want him to get a a shot somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he's carved out this career, like last year, I was thinking like, maybe nobody, nobody gives him a chance to be an every player. Maybe, that time is done for him, but like the, for him to be able to, you know, carve out nearly, he's got a thousand games under his belt now in 11 years. He just did that this year. Um, but for him to carve out that career after what happened to him and, and how things mm-hmm. fell off the rails, I'm like, I'm proud of this guy. And for him to get this kind of a resurgent career year after all of this, it makes, it makes me so happy. Like it is one of the things that has made me the most happy about sports all year long. Absolutely, man. A friggin' men. And I can't wait for him to kick the Rangers' butts this, this series, right? It's going to be a lot of fun. Can't wait for the revenge game uh, of Jerks and Profar. I'm excited to talk to you about some pitching matchups and all that stuff. You some know what I mean? Pitching matchups and some of the actual young prospects that we're going to yes. talk about right after this from our sponsors. Here's the thing, folks. I got to talk to you about the legendary, the impeccable, the unparalleled sigil of elite, fantastic beauty that is Price Picks, the number one daily fantasy sports app in the nation with over 5 million active members. Price Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. And unlike other apps, it's just you versus them numbers, man. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. So for example, if you want to say, ah, you know what? This is easy. Don't tomorrow or tonight. I'm sorry. Uh, Dylan cease. I'm going to go over on the strikeouts and Nate of I'm going to go under on innings pitched. Obviously the Padres are going to kill him. You can do both of them. So you're simultaneously rooting for a bunch of things. It's really cool. And also, they have a ton of promotions constantly uh, that cycle out throughout the year. But right now, from lowering select player stat projections on Tuesdays, right? Very cool to help your lineup even better. And getting your entry fees back if you have a losing lineup on Fridays. And that's just two, right? They're going to have more as the season goes on. I really like that overall. They have injury insurance and what have you. So, like, if you picked Xander Bogarts the day that he got hurt, if you picked uh, who's... Uh, um, um, Josh Jung, when he got hurt, hurt early on in the season. Well, guess what? If it's one or less at bats, you, it does not count as a loss in your lineup. So that's really helpful. With the finals over as well, the hoops action, though, it hasn't stopped on prize picks. Women's basketball is still heating up with stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese looking to make names for themselves as the big rookies this season or the big stars like Brandon Stewart and Asia Wilson. You can win up to 100 times your cash watching them ball out. It is fantastic and available in 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. So, folks, what in God's green earth are you waiting for, man? The world is ending. So you might as well get our prize picks, am I right? Download the prize picks app today and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That's code locked on MLB on prize picks for a deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with prize picks. Here on Locked On Rangers and Locked On Padres, you know, we pride ourselves on getting you the latest news for your team. Whether it's the offseason draft, spring training, or the playoffs, it's year round. You know what else is year round? Collection season. Just because tax season is over doesn't mean the IRS will stop coming after you for your unfiled taxes. The IRS can garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, and even seize your property. Don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals and tax experts at Tax Network USA go to bat for you. With over 14 years of experience and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau, Tax Network USA has saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. 
Whether you owe taxes, have complicated matters that require tax planning, or finally hit that parlay this season and need help correctly filing, call 1-800-549-1000 or visit TNUSA.com. Be sure to mention Locked On Rangers or Locked On Padres at checkout, and you'll receive a $250 discount off their services. Now, here we are talking about the actual prospects that I was hinting at. Of course, I am talking about Wyatt Langford and Jackson Merrill. Wyatt Langford, who was just named the co-Rangers player of the month with Josh Smith, the uh, less off, less often thought of Josh of the trio of mm-hmm. Josh's. But Jackson Merrill, another J name. Guy mm-hmm. who was absolutely crushing it this year. A guy who was a shortstop because um, apparently, <laughs> apparently this is the year that you know AJ Preller said we're building the plane entirely out of shortstop. Let's just put this shortstop into center field. The 21 year old kid out of Severna Park High School, a first round draft pick in 2021. I mean AJ Preller doing it again, pulling elite prospects out of nowhere. How does this man keep doing it? I mean, he's the one who found jerks and profile. He found my large adult son, Joseph Nicholas Gallo. I mean, this man just finds these elite, elite prospects and just keeps doing no matter how many trades he trades guys away. There's always one more. And Jackson Merrill, it's looking like he's absolutely that dude. It's, that's I love that you touched on this because this is why it's so hard to evaluate Preller. I think that he's a bad GM in very different ways. I think in terms of analytics, I think in terms of being a micromanager, all the stuff that gets reported in the athletic standing union should be in all the stuff that details Padres fans know what I'm talking about. And he does get a little bit too carried away. He's his own worst enemy. But I really don't think enough people give him credit. I'm not talking about the big signings. I'm not talking about Bogarts. I'm not talking about Darvish, Snell trades, although those trades have been great. I'm not talking about any of that, the Joe Musgrove thing. I'm talking about that this guy just a few years ago gave up the biggest haul we've probably ever seen for a prospect. And by the way, the players are good. And Mackenzie Gore and CJ Abrams and James Wood just debuted. Uh, He was like, for some people, the number one overall prospect in baseball for the team. (laughs) But then all of a sudden it's like they still have a top 10 farm system. The way he's able to find guys, he found Wood, he found C.J. Abrams, and they were not consensus top picks, by the way. If you go back and look at that draft, they were not. So he was able to find. Merrill was picked 27th overall. 27th overall. And by the way, at the time, everyone's like, okay, cool. You know, good hit tool and all that. But like another shortstop, guess what? The guy knows what he's doing. And I think that the shortstop thing I will say is I think a little bit emblematic of major league thinking, which is just – it's usually the most athletic position. So if things change, maybe that out of all the positions is the one that they can, they have the greatest success of changing, but even still for him to be able to transition to center field, be good defensively immediately, and then already tap into his power, which he's been doing a lot lately. Uh, The Red Sox saw that obviously um, a lot. So he's got like a 183 WRC plus this month. He's slugging like 600. He's been the best one of the best outfielders in the national league in general. And then also one of the best national leaguers are one of the best outfielders in baseball when you put all that together. So it's been really tremendous to see, especially in a really fun young player crop, right? You've got Wyatt Langford, you've got um, Jackson Churio, you've got Jackson holiday that have, that debuted um, this season as well. I know that he struggled. <laughs> he, yeah. he did debut. I know, he, but he, he struggled. But like, <laughs> if you headed into the season, I don't think that people would have had Jackson Merrill necessarily on the top of the top list for rookies. Um, and he's just been exactly that. But yeah, Preller deserves a lot of credit for that to be able to. The guy's got an eye for talent. He clearly, clearly does. Everything else to be a good GM, not always, but for having good talent, the Padres need credit. The fact that they can go into this deadline and they're talking about, yeah, they could go and get Garrett Crochet because they have the prospect capital. It's so rare. How many teams are out there? Look at the Pittsburgh Pirates. Pittsburgh Pirates made that bad trade, the infamous Chris Archer trade, and they've been recovering from that ever since. The Padres made the Will Myers trade with Trey Turner. That kills so many teams. The Juan Soto trade and then having him have to leave, that kills so many teams. But probably it's like, ah, whatever. I'll find someone in the draft. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. Like he's just, yep. it's, That's the thing. he's like the Tampa Bay Rays, but only with drafting, with not necessarily with the, like the, the, what's it called? The player development, but with drafting, just this man the is talent, the Rays. The talent evaluation. I don't think mm-hmm. there's a single better talent evaluator in Major League Baseball. And I don't think there has been for, 
probably 20 years, I think he's been the best at it. Because, I mean, I think that he th- his ideally in his best position was when he was assistant GM to John Daniels with the Rangers as he's out, out there going and finding this talent. I think that's the most impressive thing to me of of anybody in a front office is being able to go down to, you know, to the Dominican Republic, to, you know, Venezuela, to all these different Latin American countries, see these kids at 12, 13, 14, be like that kid right there. Yeah. He's got this, 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 and this, that he's got that potential to be an elite major league. Like that is so incredibly difficult and so incredibly impressive. And I think it's what makes G like makes him have this, this kind of, a long, a long leash. Mm -hmm. But speaking of of talented outfielders, Wyatt Langford, yeah, you know, he has been absolutely on a tear breaking out lately. Yeah. As of Mm -hmm. as of late, you know, just finished up Sunday night baseball, the first ever cycle in Sunday night baseball history. The first ever rookie to have a cycle, a grand slam, and an inside the park home run in his rookie season. He's only played 60 games, by the way. And I was seeing this tweet by a, a conceited Tigers fan saying, oh, I can't believe everyone's saying, oh, this is so dumb to pass on Wyatt Langford. Look at what this guy is doing. And it was like before he hit the IL and, uh, you know, with that hamstring issue and has been absolutely on fire ever since. I'm like, you're really mm-hmm. going to you're going to bury a 22 year old who spent about 40 games in the minors before yeah. he got called up because he was just absolutely obliterating every single level. Mm-hmm. You really, you really want to make that kind of a, you know, definitive statement on a guy's career when he's 22 years old. People do that about Bobby Wood Jr. Oh my you God. I, mean? so remember that? I remember that. I remember I the Bobby Wood Jr. I'm slander. like, that's so insane. That's so insane of these people making these definitive statements. I'm like, you do realize people can screenshot that and will be for years and years and years. You will become a meme for having the audacity to say, Oh yeah. Yeah. That white Langford wasn't great for the first 30 games. It must be a bust. Like, are you just stupid or you're doing a bit? Because either way, <laughs> you're stupid. Like absolutely it's ridiculous. Bad. And but we're gonna see them both ball out, and I'm excited for that for the series. I think that's gonna are. be the the big like storyline is gonna be like Merrill versus Langford, right? Um yeah. and I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. And I think that this series, by the way, except for the second game, good pitching matchups too, by the way. You wanna <laughs> talk about those real quick? So pretty good pitching yeah. matchups. I'm excited about this. Yeah, uh, John Gray's ERA has ballooned a little bit as of late. He had a couple of bad starts out of his last three outings. He got absolutely just shell-shocked by the Mm -hmm. Orioles in his last start out. Um, And then a couple of starts before that, he was tipping his pitches to the Mets, and they Mm -hmm. let him have it. But before that, he was amazing, like absolutely Mm -hmm. genuinely amazing. Stopped throwing the fastball as much, made the sliders primary pitch, which it's one of the better sliders in baseball, like low key under the radar. Evaldi has been great for the Rangers and Max Scherzer, while old is not washed. It was just Mm. harder for him to succeed on the Mets who were not very good. And it is easier. Well, I would say that the Rangers are good. They were last year when he (laughs) he was doing really, really well. It's a little bit more um, competitive environment there, but Scherzer has been much better. I'm excited to watch Michael King. I've seen a few starts of his Mm -hmm. Um, seeing Dylan Cease is going to be fun versus Iavali. This is going to be a fun series, a series that the Rangers, they've got to win just like every series for the next like month. Like that is the kind Mm -hmm. of hole they've dug themselves in. And they are going to be desperate. They are playing pissed off. And this lineup that has struggled mightily may be turning things around. Corey Seager got hit in the wrist by a pitch on Saturday. Turns out there is absolutely no broken bones. Thank God. Um, Maybe we'll see Josh Young back in this series. They're still waiting on inflammation Mm. in his wrist, which was broken four games into the season. Um, They're still waiting for that to kind of die down, make sure that he is 100% ready to go. We could see him as soon as this week. Maybe not. Um, Hopefully we'll see Corey Seager back sometime soon. Didn't even talk about how great Josh Smith has been. Um, So in case, in case Padres fans are surprised when Josh Smith goes, goes off this series, Know that it's not just against you. He's actually been really good this year, but this is going Mm. to be a fun, fun series. Javi, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me about jerks and profile. Profar always enjoying his success, no matter what team he's on. Y'all, that's going to do it for today's show. Thank y'all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.